Welcome to Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church in Berkeley. We are doing our best to get through this time with the grace of God. Welcome to visitors on Zoom or YouTube. Please visit our website for more information about Shepherd of the Hills at www.sothb.org. During this Lenten journey, we proclaim we are freed from shame in order to begin the work of acknowledging sin is bigger than us and deeper than we can root out. We turn to our triune God, our treasure and life, asking that God takes us as we are, summons out what we shall be, and puts the seal of a new life centered in grace upon us. Amen. We will begin with the reading of the welcome statement as read by Sylvia. Welcome to all who have no church home, want to follow Christ, have doubts, or do not believe. Welcome to new visitors and old friends. Welcome to people of every age and size, color and culture, gender identity, sexual orientation, marital status, ability, and challenge. Welcome to believers, questioners, and questioning believers. This is a place where you are welcome to celebrate and sorrow, rejoice and recover. This is a place where lives are made new. Welcome on this day. For the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. During the season of Lent, we are called to assess our lives and realign ourselves with the ways of God. Let us confess our sin. God of grace, we look around this world and we see injustice and strife. We look around this world and we see a planet expressing the need for care. We look around and acknowledge that we sin, yet sin is bigger and deeper than us. Forgive us, free us from our entanglement to sin. 
people of God, look to the beloved who with grace and mercy sets us free and heals us to love again. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now for the word for all ages. Welcome to a word for all ages. As you can see, I have this word here, weak or strong. And there is a question, is this animal weak or strong? It's not a trick question. Of course, this animal is strong. It's the strongest animal in the world, as we understand. It's a bush elephant found in Africa. Now I have another animal, and I wonder what you'll think about the next one. This is a dung beetle. What do you think about that? Is it weak or is it strong? You know, for its size, the dung beetle is incredibly strong. It can carry 1,141 times its own weight. Can you carry your own weight? How many times? One time? Two times? There you go. Incredibly, incredibly strong. Today in our readings, and Sylvia is going to read them soon, we come to Corinthians Corinthians, and it poses these words, weak or strong, wise or foolish. You know, the strongest person I ever knew was a man named Hal, who had, uh, had a brain tumor and his left arm was weak and it could not really use it. But he was married to Billy, who was a paraplegic and could only uh, move around in a wheelchair. And so he was the one that took care of her, meaning that he got her up out of bed every day and helped her into bed every night. He was incredibly strong. Can you think of people that uh, their life situations or circumstances where they look by the way that the world looks at, at them as weak, but to just live their life, they have to have an incredible amount of strength, stronger than probably, you know, the, the big strong man, the muscle building man, yeah. And there's these words, wise or foolish, the cross. People look at the cross and they'd say it's not wise and it's foolish. It's not a very smart thing to do to end up on a cross. It looks very weak, but that is how God came into the world through Jesus who walked with us and who lived his life authentically, lovingly and calling out justice that he knew that um, with the way he lived with vulnerability that he would come to the cross and it was necessary, but then he would raise again. And that's our story. Is it wise to love and then you get hurt and never love again? Is that wisdom or is that foolish? God keeps calling us to love even if we get hurt and to love again. So there's other things that might be foolish. Uh, conventional wisdom kind of tells people that they shouldn't do things because it would be foolish. You know, like if you are a woman, for many years it would say you couldn't even think of being president. But that's not true now, is it? Things are changing. It could happen. We have a vice president who's a woman. 
Can you think of other ways that our conventional wisdom restricts us by saying something is wise or foolish? Well, could you imagine that somebody in a wheelchair could, could dream of doing something that no one imagined they could do? Well, I'm gonna show you a video of a woman named Sue Aston, who for many years was bed bound. And finally, when she got this wheelchair, it opened up her life. So she's really happy to be in a wheelchair. And she is very creative and imaginative. And she dared to dream that she could be a, a deep diver in her, her wheelchair. And that's what we're gonna end up here in our word for all ages. And now we will move on with our reading. The first reading is from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no voices, no words or language, their voices are not heard, but their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the second reading is from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to 24. 
the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thank you to God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from God our creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer and our Guide. Well, you probably noticed several things. First of all, it's night. And the second thing is that there's a lot of flashy lights around me. Well, here's what I'll tell you, is that uh, I got my last vaccine today, and I just want to stay on the safe side in case I wake up in the morning and I just don't feel so hot. Uh, I will be with you. Of course, you'll know that by, by tomorrow morning, but uh, I wanted to get the sermon done just in case. Well, I'm going to talk about foolishness. And uh, so I live with a lot of foolishness, flashing lights that make uh, my life seem a little brighter during these challenging times. So here we go. I hope it's not too distracting while I talk about foolishness. There's a foolish story of a woman who wins 10,000 francs in 1885 from a French lottery. She has been living in Denmark for 14 years in exile. She was once a grand chef in Paris, living a life full of a lot of fine dining and the joy of cooking for people and being like an artist. But she had to flee 
and she's been living in this austere, pious community with two women who took her in and allowed her to be their cook. So for 14 years, this grand chef has been cooking fish soup. Now she's improved on it quite a bit from the way the women were cooking, cooking it. Uh, she's get the freshest fish she can find and the best vegetables and she uh, grows herbs and has made it certainly her own, but it's still a very limited diet. And then she wins 10,000 francs. The two women think that she's going to move back to Paris. Her name is Babette. Maybe you have read Babette's Feast. The two women's names are Martine, named after Martin Luther, and Philippa, named after Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's colleague. Her father was, their father was a Lutheran pastor who did not want them to get married and would chase off their suitors. Their father has been dead now for at least 15 years and they're coming to a moment where they want to celebrate what would have been his 100th birthday. It was their father who gathered this community together. And so this community, which is now really small, 11 people in total, want to celebrate this birthday. So Babette offers to cook a French dinner for them. At first, they don't want her to do it, but she convinces them and then she plans this incredible French dinner, fine dining for the, at its best. She sends away for the ingredients. And when the ingredients start to arrive and the people see the ingredients coming from the ship up the, the lane to that home, into the kitchen, they begin to worry there's caviars and wines and turtle for turtle soup and quail and beautiful china and silver platters. The 11 people who will be eating have decided that this lavish food is too much. They don't wanna hurt Babette's feelings, but they decide that they will eat, but they'll try not to taste the food. And they make an agreement that they won't talk about the food at all. It is an incredible meal. There was a gentleman who used to call a Martine years earlier, who is now a general, and his aunt is one of the 11. And he has come to visit her. So he is now coming to the mill, and it's now 12. He doesn't know about that agreement that they're not supposed to talk about the food. It's actually quite comical in the movie where he'll say something to someone like, oh my goodness, this, this is just wonderful wine. Is, is it not this? And the people will look at him and say, you know, it was snowy the other day. Or they will say, I took a walk down by the ocean and they just won't talk about the food. He's quite perplexed. But he comes to the point where he cannot contain himself and he says things like this meal was as good as a meal that he had in Paris at a place called Cafe Anglais where there was this incredible woman chef and she would make these meals and he said that she made meal, meals be like a love affair that it was a love affair between the physical and the spiritual well I think with a bit with his words and the food and the wine, they don't quite realize it's wine, uh, but something amazing begins to happen at that table. The elderly 11 who have been picking on each other begin to make amends. You know, there's been some cheating on business deals and even some infidelity in that small group. But all of a sudden they begin to make amends and they begin to laugh and enjoy themselves like they have never done before. They begin to relax and it's an amazing dinner and one that will be in the memory for the rest of their lives. And in that memory, it will enhance their lives. When all have gone home, Martine and Philippa thank Babette and comment on how wonderful the meal was. 
And then they acknowledge that they believe that she's now going to leave and go back to Paris because she now has this money. And Babette looks at them and says, I had no money. I spent the 10,000 francs on this mill. And they said, you spent 10,000 francs. She says, yes, I'm poor. I, I'm not going back to Paris. I'm going to stay with you. If you'll have me, of course, the sisters are quite relieved. This is a story of a woman who acts foolishly, preparing and serving and a lavish, abundant meal that is so lovingly prepared that it transforms lives. Ooh, it'd be so foolish to, to win a large amount of money and spend it all on one meal that they prepare. Who came into this world, enter into humanity, became vulnerable, even vulnerable to the cross. The cross is a price that Jesus pays for speaking truth to power, for loving people, for not avoiding conflict, as we see in the text today. He speaks out about corrupt practices that seek to tell people, particularly the poor, that they need to buy animals for sacrifice to be cleansed and to be holy. What foolishness is this that Jesus enters into? You know, there's a lot of foolishness about food in this sermon. Jesus, of course, whose ministry centered a lot about sitting down to tables and eating with people, but all sorts of people, not just the creme de la creme, but eating and enjoying company of people who are considered outcasts. The tax collector, the sinner, the prostitute, people that were not to be well known. It was important in the day of Jesus that you considered who you ate with because that said a lot about who you are. Who Jesus eats with says a lot about who he is, loving and caring and there for all people. And that is the basis of our meal that we eat with Jesus. Babette's feast was a transforming meal for the whole community. The people had a joy that they had never really known creep in. In Jesus, we are left with a meal that has the power to transform, a divine meal. Sarah Miles, a writer and a cook, who had not been to a Christian service, until she showed up at St. Gregory of Nyssa in San Francisco on Portrayal Hill, where she took communion for the first time and she noticed she was communing with Christ and it transformed her. And she took her skills and her abilities and she started a food pantry at St. Gregory of Nyssa that has lasted now over 20 years and is known across the country. She used her skills of writing to inspire people about food and spirituality and sharing food with the least of these. The meal we have in Holy Communion is not just the food, but it's the words that are said over it. Body of Christ given for you, blood of Christ shed for you individually for you, but also plural, for you, for the sake of the world. There are words in Babette's feast said by the general. Here's what he says. Truth and mercy have met together. Righteousness and bliss have kissed one another. Humans in their foolishness are short-sighted and believe that we must make certain choices in our lives and then trembles at the risk we make. He says we all know fear, but our choice is of no importance. The moment comes when our eyes are opened and we see and realize that grace is infinite. We need only wait for it 
and confidence and acknowledge it with gratitude, knowing that grace makes no conditions. That for what we have chosen is given to us. That which we have refused is given to us. That which we have rejected is given to us. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and bliss kiss one another. That is the realm of God. May you be blessed with the foolishness of grace. Infinite, lavish, abundant, confident grace. May grace be why we do what we do. Amen. And now Jeannie and I will lead the faith affirmation. We believe that God is present in the darkness before dawn. In the waiting and the uncertainty where fear and courage join hands and the sun rises on a weary world. We believe in a with us God who enters into our midst to share our humanity. We affirm a faith where we are deemed worthy not by what we do, or by how much money we make, but by the word of God's love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, whose heart is with all creation. Who invites us to move from a place of resentment and fear to a home of justice and grace for all. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You sent your son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry our ELCA Global Partner Churches, and Young Adults in Global Mission. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
Your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort to those who mourn. We pray especially for Ava, Gina, Carol, Rosie, Dorla, Nina, Lillian, Florence, Esther, Gifford, Bob, Frida, Don, and Nat. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. By grace we have been saved. Fill this congregation with your overflowing grace that we may show mercy to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry, especially children, and bless our ministries of feeding and shelter, especially yea. Give us patience and courage when the way seems long. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For whom and what else do the people of God pray? Please unmute to share your prayers. I would just praise, pray and give thanks for the, the wondrous God that we have, the first song, God, God the sculptor, and all the things that God does that can inspire us to even be, uh, can inspire someone like Sue Aston to take her wheelchair down into the ocean. Uh, God is amazing, and I give thanks for that. <clears throat> I pray for my uh, friends, Jim, uh, who's uh, got pancreatic cancer, um, and my friend, Mary, who I believe also has pancreatic cancer, um, just that they get comfort and healing. I would like to pray for all the students and teachers going back to school. Your son was lifted up that whoever believes might have eternal life. We praise you all for all those who have died in Christ. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready to share the peace. And as we do that, why don't we imagine that we're all deep sea diving and we're, we're in water together and we're floating around and having a good time. So let's just kind of have a moment of fun and connection and the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Peace the Lord. Go, 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 That was cute. Um, the thank offering for Lent was chosen by Allie. At the time of her bar mitzvah, in lieu of gifts, she directed people to donate to the Contra Costa County Food Bank. And the food bank serves to distribute purchased and donated perishable and non-perishable to low-income people and to other nonprofit organizations serving the ill, needy, and children while raising public awareness on issues of food Jay, and hunger. So you can unmute to share your thank uh, offering. What can we still share? Do a face. Some people just do. I'm thankful for the person that gave back Mama's wallet after she lost it in O'Neill Park. Uh, Bruno and I would like to uh, give thanks for Tian, our son, whose birthday is today. Yay. Happy birthday.
I'll give thanks for food banks in general. Um, I volunteered with some workers at the San Francisco Food Bank a little over a year ago. And the warehouses at these food banks are amazing. And it was nice to see that when they do, when you do pack, and we, we packed up boxes that were going to a specific community center and it was healthy food. It wasn't just like processed, you know, canned macaroni and cheese, things like that. It was some pretty good stuff. So I, I'm really um, thankful for food banks. I'm gonna give thanks for the vaccine and in particular for a FEMA program that our health center was able to be part of. Uh, our CEO got a call on Wednesday evening. Uh, it was discussed on Thursday and we started on, we started Saturday giving vaccines to some of the hard, one of the hardest hit uh, areas of Oakland. Um, and uh, it was a really record amount of amazing turnaround. I worked the phones yesterday to schedule appointments. And so for the next, after this weekend, uh, for the next five weekends, Friday through Monday, um, there's an ability to get a uh, vaccine if you fall within the Alameda County tiers, uh, certain essential workers, and they've located this FEMA um, vaccine clinic in one of the you know hardest hit and poorest neighborhoods of West Oakland. So my, our hope is that a lot of folks in that uh, zip code and surrounding zip codes will get vaccinated. Please join me in the offering prayer. Gracious God, for the morning dawn, which promises new life, and for your love, which knows our name, we give you thanks for a place to belong, for this place to belong, and for grace that is always bigger than we deserve, for the promise of justice that will roll down like a mighty stream, we give you thanks. We have so much to thank you for, gracious God. We offer you these gifts. And may we participate in the care and redemption of this world. Amen. And now we'll prepare for the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. I'm going to invite you to unmute and to say the prayer in the country, well, the language from the country that's most comfortable for you. Our Father, Mother in heaven, the kingdom, the glory are yours, now and forever, amen. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours, now and forever, amen. And now for the benediction. These Lenten days we journey, examining, assessing with hope of realigning with the ways of God. May the outpouring of the love of our triune God bless us and keep us. May we remember we are not alone. May the peace that surpasses all understanding fill our hearts in the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. <laughs>
And now for the dismissal. Live in forgiveness, claim your wholeness, and dwell in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you.